Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second session of this morning. Um, to introduce Professor Insler is really something which is, uh, has been done time and time and time again. You have a brief resume on your program, tells you who he is. Although I must admit, <coughs> excuse me, I don't like the likeness. Uh, he's far more glamorous than his photograph would suggest. <laughs> um, apart from the fact that he's such a good professor, there is also the question of his famous translation, 1975, getting up to 30 years, of the Gathas of Zarathustra, which is the introduction which is extremely valuable. It was valuable then, it's valuable now. And bearing in mind the discussion we had with our first speaker, I have to quote Stanley Inslow, and this is quoting from memory, I hope that Stanley Inslow will forgive me if I have a minor lapse, where it says, misplaced fascination with ritual, which is the case. Stanley has really done us proud with his translation. It places the Gathas in the doctrinal context, the words of Zarathustra Spitana himself. I cannot say more on that score, but I would remind speakers that he was invited to give the SOAS Jordan lectures for this year, and he gave a series of five lectures to do with the comparison and contrast between the Rig Vedic themes and Avistic themes. It was a brilliant tour de force. We await its publication. I will not detain you any longer, and without further preamble, I will ask Stanley Insler to please decipher for us Zarathustra's genetic code. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farouk. It's always, let's say, good to have a friend introduce you. They say kinder things than anyone else would. And I must say, on repeated occasions, having been introduced by Farouk, uh, he gets more skilled right, each time he has introduced me. But uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure I live up to the, the brilliant, glamorous introduction that he gave, but uh, I will try and uh, say something new difficult before uh, an audience like yours. Since we're being very informal, allow me to take my coat off as well. <laughs> the year 2003 marked an important milestone in the history of Zoroastrianism. I'm referring, of course, to UNESCO's declaration of 2003 as the 3,000th anniversary of the remarkable religion and design for living founded by Zarathustra sometime around the turn of the first millennium before our current era. As many of you may know, special events were scheduled around the world to celebrate this turning point, commemorating the survival of Zoroastrianism as one of the world's oldest living faiths. These events bear testimony of the pride and esteem that living Zoroastrians possess for their extraordinary religion. There was an extremely interesting issue of Amazor published in Bombay with contributions that touched upon almost every important aspect of the history of Zoroastrianism and its contemporary conditions around the world today. A seminar on Zoroastrianism was arranged at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. in December, and a similar meeting took place in Anaheim, California, later in the same month. I was honored to have participated in these events, and I was delighted to have seen that both meetings attracted large and engaged audiences who were most eager to learn and to discuss matters considering the history and doctrines of Zoroastrianism. And here I am again today among my Zoroastrian friends in London at this event sponsored by WZO, 
convened once more in celebration of the UNESCO Declaration. Suffice it, I am equally honored and pleased to be present today, especially among so many familiar faces. When asked why I am so fascinated by Zarathustra, my invariable answer is that I am a closet Zoroastrian. By that I mean to express that I believe in everything taught by Zarathustra, although I have not been born into the faith. For the simple fact is, the principles first taught by Zarathustra are of such universal nature, they are immediately appealing and compelling to anyone who has studied them carefully. And in my case, the study of them has endured throughout most of my adult lifetime. Truthfully, sometimes I wonder whether I have anything new to say about Zarathustra, having written and lectured about him so frequently. And yet each time I return to the subject from a different perspective, I realize that the extraordinary system designed by Zarathustra can be analyzed quite productively from alternate points of view. So with your indulgence, allow me to contrast two separate yet interesting ways of conceiving some of the fundamental concepts of Zarathustra's philosophical religion. <coughs> some of you may remember that I delivered a series of lectures here in London at Z House a few years ago, and that one of them titled The System of Amusha Spenters. In that lecture, I attempted to demonstrate that through traditional order of Amusha Spenters, or holy immortals, as depicted in later Zoroastrian texts, was inherited from Zarathustra himself, and that this order was precisely arrayed by the Prophet to form a coherent, closed, and productive system. So allow me to my views and to begin right by recalling the order of the Amusha Spenters at this time. One, Bohumanu, good thinking. Two, Asha, truth. Three, Bohushasra, good rule. Four, Humility, respect. Five, Havratat, health. Six, Amritat, continuing life. To repeat their order again only in English, we find the fixed succession of good thinking, truth, good rule or sovereignty, respect, health, and continuing life. Furthermore, I noted, and this is the important point, that each member of the series is dependently connected with the adjacent ones. That is to say, good thinking leads to the understanding of truth, Truth formulated as the laws of society is the basis of all good rule or government. Good rule government fosters respect for it, and when there is respect for the ruling authority or government, society is healthy and vigorous, thus encouraging further good and positive thinking among the people. And thus the circle of this closed system continues in a loop producing the further external result of peace and prosperity for everyone. I've depicted this cyst closed system here on this first uh, flip. We have Vobu Manu, good thinking, Asha, truth, Vobu Shastra, good rule, Amrit, um, sorry, Aramati, sorry, I'm not reading upside down, <laughs> respect, Havata, um, health, and Amrita continuing life. And as you can see, they're all connected with one another, and each is dependent upon the, on the preceding one. Good thinking encourages an understanding of truth, truths which are the laws right, of God, the rule. Good rule has no meaning without any respect, but once all of these four things are in place, then of course there is health and continuing life either a person or to society itself. What is equally important, as I pointed out, is that the elements of this closed system 
can function as well in the opposite direction, namely health and vigor among people encourage respect for good government, better laws embodied in social truths, and these laws lead to progressive good thinking, consequently strengthening the health and vigor of society once again. The system of emotional conditions in both directions as a productive and prosperous model for any society or social structure. And it is a tribute to Zarathustra's to have engineered this effective system from such simple elements that have universal import for all time. The wisdom of Zarathustra's system is sadly seen in its converse that seems to be the typical world situation today. By this I mean to say, wherever we look around, it appears that bad thinking has led to deceit and bad government, engendering disrespect, with the result that society has become unhealthy and its future quite uncertain. With more than a tinge of regret, I'm ashamed to say, that my country is currently a clear model of the working of such a perverted version of Zarathustra's system of Amusha Spentos. There, false notions have led to ignoring both national and international laws, creating a misguided administration for which little respect exists within the country or within the community of nations. And as a consequence of the preceding issues, a large part of American society, as well as foreign communities, feel sickened and extremely negative about the future of the world. The net result of this, of course, is that instead of the correct system creating peace and prosperity, this perverse system has produced strife and economic hardship, both at home and in the rest of the world. Our contemporary situation is precisely the one Zarathustra encountered during his own lifetime. It was the large-scale spread of deceit, evil, and strife in his world, documented in the Gathas, that motivated the prophet to reflect upon the organization of society and the elements within it, within it that were false and corrosive, and how they had become that way. He understood, just as we do today, that the basis for the unrest and discontent in his world were false ideas, theft, exploitation, bad rulers who disrespected the laws of society, and every other sort of malignant social act and political policy. By examining what was wrong in his world, Zarathustra imagined a world in which everything could be right and could be true, resulting in benefits for all members of society. But we may well ask, how could Zarathustra conceive of what was right by examining what was wrong? The answer to this question is rather simple. From Yasna 30.6, we learn that Zarathustra conceived of the presence of evil in the world as a disease that inflicted mankind. And from Yasna 31.19, we equally learn that the prophet calls himself a world healer. In fact, the whole plan for the restoration of the best existence presented in the Gathas is conceived of as a curative and healing process. Therefore, cannot we conclude from these direct references that Zarathustra was not only a priest but he was also a physician. This dual role is in no way unusual in the ancient world because healing was considered a holy art dealing most often with life and death situations in antiquity and it was quite normal that adept priests were also trained in the skills of medicine and healing precisely for the reason that they came close to God right, in the question of life and death. Consequently, like all physicians, Zarathustra had to have understood 
cause and effect, since this is the basis of all medical treatment, and his training as a physician was most helpful in allowing him to apply this knowledge to the construction of the system of a Musha Spentance. <coughs> the mention of disease and healing finally brings me to the announced title of this lecture, Sarathustra's Genetic System, which is the second approach to analyzing the system of holy immortals I have in mind today. I conceived of this idea because the year 2003 also commemorated the 50th anniversary of the publication by Crick and Watson of their classical paper on the structure and replication of DNA, the building material for the survival and growth of all living things. Since we are celebrating the survival of Zoroastrianism on the one hand, and the Crick and Watson paper describes the system of survival of all living beings on the other hand, I wondered whether it would be possible to apply the insights concerning the structure and replication of DNA to the system of Amusha Spentas. As expected, this idea bore fruitful results. But before I can proceed, some comments about cell biology are necessary. But don't be alarmed, I'm not about to launch into a complicated scientific discussion. Number two. Every cell consists of three parts. A nucleus, surrounding matter called cytoplasm, and an encompassing membrane or cell wall. These are directly comparable to the elements of a common egg, as seen in the yolk, the egg white, and the egg shell. Furthermore, the nucleus of every cell contains all the information that is necessary for the development and future survival of the living being. You can easily comprehend this from the fact that a fertilized chicken egg will hatch a baby chick which in due course will develop into an adult hen or rooster. All this information is contained in the chromosomes of the cell nucleus, on which are arrayed seemingly endless specific genes that determine the different inherited traits and characteristics that mark an individual and his lineage. Both the chromosomes, as well as the genes, are composed of DNA, which is fundamental to everything. In contrast to the cell nucleus, the cytoplasm of a cell, that is this part which is like the egg wand, contains the proteins and amino acids that are necessary to store energy and food for the continuing growth and development of the living being. The production of the sustaining proteins and amino acids are ultimately controlled by the DNA in the cell nucleus. So much for cell biology. Crick and Watson determined that the structure of DNA is elegantly simple. It consists of two parallel strands on which there are resting only four separate elements that we can call one, two, three, and four, such that the element one can, bind, can combine only with element two, and element three only with element four. Elements one and three appear on one strand of DNA, elements two and four on the second strand, and both strands twist around each other in the form of a double helix. You can picture the structure of DNA easily in the form of a twisted ladder on which the rungs of the ladder consist of the paired elements 1 and 2 and the paired elements 3 and 4. Such is the simple structure of DNA. So here we have the two strands which are parallel with one another 
on strand one are elements one and three, on strand two, elements two and four. One and two can only combine with one another, three and four can only combine with one another. And so it goes, these are layered in endless, endless chains, and what causes the differentiation is simply how the one, two, one, two, three, fours are organized along here. But there are only four elements at play. DNA replicates, that is, produces itself by having the two strands of the helix separate. After separation, the individual strands build a new strand that is identical to the one that has separated from the original helix. That is to say, the now single strand consisting of elements one and three triggers the formation of a new complementary strand consisting of elements two and four, and the original strand with elements two and four forms a new complementary strand with elements one and three. Namely, the same thing is being reproduced over and over again, right? All living beings survive by continually producing DNA in this remarkably simple fashion. Let us now turn to Zarathustra's system of Amusha Spentas and see how the DNA model might be applied to the basic elements for his design for living. Let us first note that there is a basic distinction between the first four elements of good thinking, truth, good rule, and respect on the one hand, and health and continuing life on the other. In the first place, it is clear from reading the Gathas that health and continuing life for both man and God are dependent upon the existence of the prior four elements. Zarathustra continually stresses that neither health nor continuing life can exist either for God or for man without the proper presence of good thinking, truth, good rule, and respect. In this light, health and continuing life are the equivalent of the proteins and amino acids in the cell cytoplasm, the chemical entities that foster and promote the proper growth, development, and survival of the organism itself. Consequently, just as the proteins and amino acids are ultimately dependent upon the DNA in the cell nucleus, so too health and continuing life are produced and dependent upon the four fundamental elements of the Amusha Spentas. There can be no health or continuing life for man or God without the existence of good thinking, truth, good rule, and respect. These are the fundamental elements necessary for the survival of both. Secondly, Zarathustra makes it explicitly clear in his poems that truth and good thinking on the one hand, good rule and respect on the other hand, stand in complementary relationships. He repeatedly informs us that the understanding of truth comes only through good thinking, and that rule or any other form of authority has no meaning without the proper respect for it. Therefore, we can map these four simple elements on a double helix model in which good thinking and respect appear on one strand, and truth and good rule appear on the other, with the bonding between both strands formed by the complementary pairs of these basic elements. And this I show simply by replacing one, three, two, and four, by good thinking, respect, truth, and good rule. And here you see the bonding between the two. Good thinking, right, is bound with truth, right, and good rule is bound with respect. The two are essential, right, in order to have any kind of meaningful or productive manner. Furthermore, we can now understand how the system of elements reproduces itself in a manner similar to DNA. The two strands separate, and the one with good thinking and respect will form a new complementary strand with truth and good rule, 
and the strand with truth and good rule will form a new one with good thinking and respect. This occurs because the elements on each of the strands cannot survive without the element on the other. And in this regard, the DNA model of the holy entities is similar to the systems model I first discussed. The two models function in both directions, and the elements of each model are dependent upon those on the other. Again, it is the simplicity of the organization of the DNA model that allows it to work so successfully, not only in nature, but also in society or religion. Finally, there's a very important point I need to underscore. When I began the discussion about DNA, I mentioned that Zarathustra considered evil and deceit to be a disease that afflicted the world of mankind. Once the prophet has made this point in Yasna 30.6, in the very next verse, he states that Ahura Mazda came into the world with his rule of truth and good thinking, and that enduring respect gave body and breath to it. That is to say, the respect of man gave life to the good rule of God. By this statement, Zarathustra has pointed out two fundamental notions. First, that the remedy or medicine for curing the disease of evil and deceit in the world is a sovereign rule that is based on truth and good thinking. And secondly, that such a sovereign rule cannot exist without respect for its authority. All four elements are necessary for ridding the world of evil and deceit, and all four elements are equally necessary for the survival of both God and mankind. <coughs> Cast in the simplest terms, truth, good thinking, enlightened government, and respect are the basic genetic elements for the survival of the world, the only ones that can produce peace and prosperity, growth and stability, and all the healthy conditions that will promote the progressive advance of mankind. I am not suggesting by this lecture that Zarathustra was the first biological geneticist. Rather, I do believe that the prophet was a physician and that he understood the relationship between disease and remedy. However, his great insight allowed him to view evil and deceit in the world as a disease, and his great intelligence allowed him to propose a model for eliminating this disease and returning the world to a healthy condition by which it could survive and live into the future. That the model he proposed for world survival consists of four basic interrelated elements that find a direct parallel in the four interrelated elements found in DNA of living beings, demonstrates that the most complex conditions and problems can most often be solved in the simplest and most elegant fashion. It is a pity that this approach is almost invariably ignored in our times and buried under the clutter and corrosiveness of overcomplicated and vapid proposals that lead nowhere except to further difficulties that increase maladies all over. <coughs> On the other hand, the Prophet Zarathustra's simple genetic code for survival has blissfully allowed a great religion to endure for 3,000 years and to impart to its followers a simple and effective model for sustaining their own lives and those around them. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too complicated to follow. Watson, had they known about Zarathustra, they would have uh, deciphered the DNA code much sooner. Alas, they were there. The second set of elements 
of Professor Stanley Insler and the UK. I propose we start a new movement. Stop Stanley Insler. Stop him from leaving the UK. He must speak to us more. Now, without further ado, we do have time for questions, comments, answers. Please, the floor is open. And uh, would, you, would you prefer to stand in the No, I like standing. Sorry. I don't need the microphone. Um, let's take the model, good thinking. The first one. Yes. Now, if you see George Bush today, President Bush, <laughs> how would you start training him to good thinking with the lost cause? It's not well, good. You would need a major implant, right? <laughs> <laughs> they also would need better advisors, right? I mean, the best thing is to put him on the next Mars mission. <laughs> so I can't do it. I wish I could. Right? And I'm not only George Bush, I don't understand why Tony Blair, who is a very intelligent man, licks George Bush's behind, right? Because if no one can be that stupid, right? So there has to be a hidden agenda here, unfortunately. And we know anything hidden is deceptive. Well, I just thought it was thinking. No, you need an implant. Right? <laughs> First thing is a lobotomy. Well, probably he needs a new, a new brain. Right? And unfortunately, it's too late for that. I'm just curious to know how did this all go wrong, though? How did this start becoming a disaster as it is now? Why did this theory, you know, not sort of, you know, follow the right path all the way, and uh, you know? We are where we are at the moment, you know, with the example of George Bush and Tony Blair. Well, this thing has been going on forever. Okay. It obviously went on in Zarathustra's time, before Zarathustra's time, right? Because if you believe in dualism, and I do believe in dualism, okay, if there's night, there's day, if there's up, there's down, if there's good, there's evil, all right? I'm not saying we're genetically predisposed that way. Maybe we are, right? That is to say, but I think greed, avarice, uh, lies, and deception are as old as mankind. And so what we have been fortunate enough, right? Just a few times in the history of the world, great thinkers like Zarathustra, right, or Moses, or Buddha, right, arose among the people and showed them where things were wrong, where things were deceptive, right, where they were going down the right path, and suggested what the right path could be. However, the point is there were fewer people who had such understanding rather than the majority who were, how shall I say, seduced, right, by what looked like, you know, a, a more comfortable way to read the Bible. Truth is never comfortable, right? I mean, anybody who has faced, you know, any kind of difficulty in a lifetime, right, or been presented, right, with situations that are highly complex, knows that to find the truth about it, to act with truth in these situations, is 10 times more difficult than to cave in and say, okay, you know, I'll go with it now, and maybe when I have time, I'll do it. People simply don't have courage, right? But you have to have knowledge first to have courage, right? And I think this world lacks a lot of courage today. And why it does so, I don't know. I mean, there's a globalization of greed, okay? There's the notion that instead of waiting, right, for things to ripen and mature as nature wanted it to be, we want instant results tomorrow, right, if not this afternoon. Think of email. I remember the blissful days of old post when I would write a letter, you know, to someone in Germany. It took a week for them to get it, a week to send, to write a reply and a week for me to get three weeks passed by, and we were happy, we were wonderful, right? It gave us time to do other things. Now I get an email, if I don't answer it in 20 minutes, I get, you know, 40 repeats saying, why haven't you answered my email? And I write back, because I'm bloody of interest, not interested in doing so. So where did it go wrong? I don't know, why has there always been war? Why has there always been... But the point is, despite this, it is disease, okay? The minute disease takes place, remember the cure has set in at the same time, right? And fortunately enough, 
there have been enough people right, throughout history who have been immune, let me put it, let me, let's talk in medical terms, immune so that their own system, their own mind, their own courage, their own view of the world has been strong enough to fight off any of the kind of disease of deception and greed and anything else that they've been attacked with. And I think it's going that way forever. Very hopeful. Yes, I am very hopeful. I wouldn't be a Zoroastrian otherwise. <laughs> Would you say that um, the period of the Achaemenid king, Cyrus the Great, who is the founder of, or we claim that he laid the foundation for the first <coughs> human rights uh, declaration, and Darius, who is known to have ruled his empire with a reasonable degree of uh, responsibility, social responsibility, and who left an uh, inscription saying, with the help of Ahura Mazda, I found the strength to run my country according to the right Not only Mazda, it's the truth. Yeah, true. for the truth. So would you say that those are the models that um, perhaps embodied and practiced something of the teachings that they found in the Gathas? Yes. And are there others like them that you could perhaps uh, remind us of? Well, I mean, if you look at the history of any modern country in a way, okay, there were periods, right? <coughs> Now, natural expansionism is always a problem, right? Because they're always impinging on into your own political borders from other sides, so you have to fight back. Nonetheless, there have been periods in modern history where governments have had enlightened constitutions, okay? With laws, you know, offering equal opportunity to everyone, in which people have been happy and content, right? Uh, how fast these faded and were replaced by others, you know, we all well know. But there is always the possibility, right? Except, you know, I have to work to make a disillusion in common, but I, things getting worse, but there has to be more, more truth, all right? And to get the truth out is what's important. I mean, we've heard about, this is what the problem in Tajikistan is, right? How do you get the truth out? How do you get people to understand what's really going on, right? It's so much easier to, to say that we have a clandestine group is fine, okay? under particular circumstances, it had to be. I mean, I have friends, you know, lived on, in the Soviet Union, you know, long, long periods, and everything had to be done clandestinely. But you can't forget the truth. It's, not, it's too easy to forget the truth. And that's what's bad. Yeah, I, 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 do, do we think we should start with Iran, the homeland? where the names of the monks carry the name Bahman, which means Bohu Manot, and Armaike, we have Shakri uh, Bar, which means uh, correct rule. And we have all these concepts built into the Persian structure. It, every month has its name and it's all ties back there. And one would hope that there could be this kind of awakening to what things really mean there, since they actually have an institution. You know, after 9-11, the Iranians were very, very sympathetic to America. I mean, they went out and protested with everything. And then that schmuck George W. Bush came up with the axis of evil, right? In which he named Iran, Iraq, and North Korea, right? And that simply, you know, the people said, what are we doing? Why, why are we showing any kind of sympathy for America, right? When, you know, they act this way towards us. Right? I mean... Correction, you said Iran, not Iran. Iran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you want to know something interesting? There was a document that was published by him. Harvard Conservative Institute, right? Two years before, in 1999, right? this document was called Rebuilding America's Defenses, all right? And the document, which goes through 98 pages of garbage, right? Basically, had one important point. The only way that we can, you know, protect America in the future is to have a base of operation in the Middle East and a base of operation in Asia. And going into Iraq, right, and all of the brouhaha over North Korea, right, belongs to this major plan. It had nothing to do with terrorism, it had nothing to do with Saddam Hussein, you know, and if you ask how many Americans know about this, it would be 0.00002%. I mean, I send this document to everybody that I know. I mean, the whole thing is a subterfuge. It is a whole tissue of deceits and lies and Horrible. I'm looking for somewhere to move. Should I go to the UK? <laughs> I, I can't do that. I'm Jewish, right? <laughs> I'm a new 
Zealand. Let's start a new Zoroastrian world in New Zealand. No, I just wanted to ask, excuse my throat, that it's such a good religion. The more I read, the more I hear. And I fail to understand how handful people have hijacked or monopolized this religion and they are stopping other people to learn from it or to improve their lives on it. And they, I think it's time they should give chance to other people to come in and follow the path. I mean, I mentioned this before to someone else. In Judaism, we have four or five different kinds of Judaism. You know, we have the progressive, the reform, the conservative, the semi-conservative, the orthodox, the dooming orthodox, everything, okay? Never get to be able to agree about it, right? They all think different things, and each one feels, why are these other people right, creating such a hindrance you know, for the rest to you know to understand? It's what human nature is like. I mean, there is just, there is one road, okay, but many ways to go, right, on that one road. But they obstruct. They don't let the other people get on the road. Well, challenging the first two elements, good thinking, true, truth. I mean, the good example you just gave regarding uh, Judaism, you got different versions. I say, um, from where you stand, life, good thinking may be different from me when I'm sitting here. My view to good, good thinking leading to truth may be different from where you're standing over there. So there's no such thing as good thinking and truth, which is a fundamental element of your DNA. You see, I've lectured about truth on many times. I mean, and here's the point. When you read the Gospels, it's very frustrating. Okay, so I'm keep saying, we should do this with truth, we should do that with truth, we should do blah, 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 blah. Okay, you want to know, what is this truth, all right? Now, it's quite clear, right, and if you have listened to my London lectures and my Zed, Zed House lectures a few years ago, the truth, right, he always gives the answer to these puzzling questions in the Gospels themselves. Truth, in Zarathustra's terms, are the laws that are over us that are revealed to him, okay? The way to behave properly in society. So in a certain sense, truth, in that sense, is like the Ten Commandments of the Jews, right? Now, no matter what kind of sect you follow in Judaism, you all believe in the Ten Commandments in a certain sense, right? And in Zoroastrianism, right? No matter what kind of sect there may have been, right? The point was, right, you had to understand through your thinking that the laws, okay, that Ahura Mazda uh, proclaimed to Zarathustra were the ones, right, to build a progressive, safe, and honest society. So that's what I'm saying about the truth. Truth is, there are no alternate versions of truth. Okay? They can, I mean, this was a fiction that people used to say. I, mean, I had a colleague at Yale who founded a whole international movement that was extremely irritated, in which he said, there are no truths, there are only shifting fictions. Okay? <laughs> the minute you accept such a notion, all right, then there's nothing to strive for. There's no goal. If there are shifting fictions continuously and the ground is moving under you, right? Or today you're in, you know, East Pakistan and tomorrow you're in Singapore, right? there is no orientation, okay? Truth has to be absolute, right? And if you read the Gathas really carefully, right? Man does not reach truth. Truth only resides with Ahura Mazda. And Ahura Mazda is the only one who has created it and he has proclaimed it through Zarathustra. So it is absolute. Right? So when we talk about good thinking is necessary right, to, to understand the truth, what Zarathustra really means is you have to understand, okay, through your right way of thinking, that the principle, okay, that Ahura Mazda created for survival of society, right, mankind, right, are the only way to go. But the I think the truth, as every time in history, changes as it goes. The truth, no. three thousand years. No, ago, the shadow of truth changed, not truth itself. So what's the difference of shadow truth? What people think is the truth and not really the truth. It's a matter of conscience, right? No. I mean, you should once you've learned things, you you should know what's right or wrong. But are we inherent? Do we have an inherent kind of 
biological genetic nature that determines, lets us know immediately what's right or wrong? No. You have to be taught that. And that's the whole purpose of, you know, socialization and religious training. Certain things we know, I think, are genetic, right? Because they are biological, like killing somebody, okay? You're not, we're naturally inclined not to kill somebody. But other things are, you know, good rule, something like that. I don't think it's, that's not genetic. Can uh, Hilda, please? Oh, Hilda, um, just, I don't think I can be thinking very well. Yeah. But I can't understand if this has been going for so many centuries, and this is a very basic way of living your life. Why is it the the people who actually invaded us from Persia, and you know who I'm talking about? Why are they so aggressive in their in their thinking? Why are they wanting to do nothing but malign other people? How has it changed so much in Iran and that area of the Middle East? They've been taught wrong. But, but why is it people that are being taught who should be having good judgment and who should be having a, uh, intelligence here, working there, why are they thinking so badly? I don't know. If you could find it, bottle it, and sell it, we are to be a great engineer. Maybe we should, should all do what Indigit is saying and become Zoroastrians all the world. Right? Or at least make people understand what it's all about. Right? I mean, as I said in the beginning, I consider myself a Zoroastrian. I know I'm not a Zoroastrian, but the point is I believe in what Zoroastrian just said. Right? And to do so is fine, as far as I'm concerned. Maybe our theologists should study evil rather than the truth. Because I'm a serious believer that you have to know your enemy very well. But this is the whole point I mentioned about it. I couldn't go into detail. When you look at the gossip, the documentation of evil in the world is what Zarathustra basically talks about, okay? He doesn't say how did we know what's good, but he points out what is evil. And naturally, since there is this documentation and all of this thinking, that's how you understand what's good, by identifying what's the evil. So I don't think we want to, I think evil has been studied quite long and quite deeply in the history of the world. In fact, too much so. Mm -hmm. Um, well, my, I have to, uh, my question consists of two parts. Uh, the first part is that uh, the priests in any religion, they try to always they try to find a way for the survival of their religion. First of all, I want to know what uh, priests in the Zoroastrian uh, religion they have done for this matter. And secondly, the concept of heaven and hell, as I've heard, uh, originated from the Western and then it uh, went into uh, Christianity. Okay, friends, about the priests, alright? Alright, uh, let's see. Uh, Zoroastrian priests, right? right. uh, Zoroastrianism is no different than all other religions insofar as the grammar of religion. This is what I would Ritual is the grammar of religion, right? That's learned by everybody, right? It's like a common language essentially, right? And this is what allows as a language to pass on from generation to generation very simply. Ritual functions, that has a precise function right within society. But the grammar, as we know, or let's say, knowing how to form the right words of the language doesn't write the text in a certain sense, right? We have, you know, some ability to take all of this grammar that we have in our head and make some Potentially, every great book is in your head, right? I mean, you cannot have every possible sentence that anyone could have ever spoken or will <coughs> ever speak or have a grammatical system, and this is what ritual is. <coughs> Beyond ritual, okay, ritual has to be contextualized, all right? It has to be put, right, in some kind of scene that is it even a greater significance and meaning. And that scene, you know, is understanding what it's all about and why there is ritual, okay? Many people go through life just performing ritual without any sense what is the purpose of ritual, right? And what does the ritual stand for? And even more, what do the texts mean, okay? That are sort of, for the most part, automatically repeated continuously in ritual. <coughs> so this answers the fact that, you know, priests are important for ritual and so and so. 
why, what was the second question about? Uh, oh, well, well, heaven and hell? I mean, I, no, heaven and hell existed among other religions, too. I thought that it was originated in Zoroaster and then it went to Judaism itself. I mean, every religion likes to think it's the oldest and it's been basic, you know, the, the body from which other things have been borrowed. It's, I'm just not quite sure. Yeah? So how does uh, this religion encourage people to practice the teachings? Oh, here's the answer. And that's a clear answer about Zoroaster. The Zoroastrian philosophy I know is you don't know what's going to happen next, all right? That is, but you do know what's going to happen here in your own lifetime. And consequently, because that's the only thing we're sure about, we must make our life as best as possible, right? And how can we make our life as best as possible? Well, by, you know, the good thoughts, good words, and good deeds, right? And to understand how all of it works together. That's what I, and it's the same thing for Judaism. Right? I mean, Judaism doesn't believe in heaven or hell. Right? It's just a kind of modern notion that's been grafted onto it. And Judaism right, offers the same, the same lack of choice in a certain sense, or the same understanding to its practitioners. You don't know what's going to happen next. So in this life, it is in this life you have to make your great commitment to do your best, right? as if it was the only chance. When I teach about Indian religion, my people who believe in this say to me, do I believe in reincarnation? I say, no. But they say, well, how could you be so interested in Sanskrit and things Indian if you weren't at one time born in India? And I said, well, that's another matter. And I said, even if there were reincarnation, I would reject it simply because I like to think I have only one shot of being alive and I want that one shot to be the best that I can make it. I mean, and I think everybody should go through life precisely that way. Not worry about what your future reward may be, but to worry about what your current reward is. Right? Or the reward that you give to other people by acting in the proper manner. One last long question, or two short questions. <laughs> A long question. Suppose, now to be advocate of a devil, suppose the two stool was wrong, then what would they uh, think of it this way? If the two was right, then everything and everybody believed him, and everybody said, All right, we are all Zoroastrians, we are going to do truth, everything is truth. And, so there will be no wars, there will be no disease, nothing. Right? So the world would have been static, absolute static. We wouldn't have no emails, we wouldn't have no other thing. So in fact, I think, you know, on the other hand, George Bush and Tony, uh, Tony Blair could be right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, so because uh, then the progress has been made. You have to wear nice shirts and nice ties and nice trousers, otherwise you wouldn't have anything. You would be living in the, uh, with the skin clothes. All if right. Zatustu was right. Well, here's the truth. Okay, maybe Zatustu was right. The point is, he and his people would have behaved one way, but you can be sure their neighbors didn't behave that way. Right? And it is a dynamic, right, always of impingement, right, that forces us, no matter how committed, right, how noble, right, how optimistic, how, how perfect we may be to act perfectly. We have to, that to be some response. But I would rather think that he was right. right. And I think more than, than having proposed a model, let's say, for a country, right? and to some degree there was success, as we know from, from the success of the Achaemenid Empire, I think the model more is in the individual, in the family, and in the community, the smaller community. Whether a nation can ever follow such a model, right, is a very difficult one. I mean, despite all the fact that, you know, that Darius thanks us continuously, thanks Ahura Mazda and Truth for letting him done that, what has he done? He's gone out and conquered people, right? He's taken prisoners, all of whom have to pay tribute to him, right? 
So, I mean, the point is, can you be a good guy and a bad guy at the same time? I mean, there's usually good cop against bad cop, you know, playing off the things in one manner or another. I often say I wear several hats, I think, at my institution, but I never wear them simultaneously. The trouble is when you're a politician, you have to, right? And that's the bad thing. Right? When you're a prophet, of course, you can't. But hats off to Zarathustra. I would ask Professor Insner to stay put while I view him at a slight distance and somebody else is just going to take him temporarily. Would you mind? No. Thank you. You're yeah, not going to have to do Ladies and gentlemen, today, our world body, the World Zoroastrian Organization, is taking the unique step of honoring a person who was born in and pursues a fate other than Zoroastrianism. That person is the world-renowned Gothic scholar, Professor Stanley Insler, who has once again regaled us in today's seminar with his insightful and magnificent presentation. Educated at Columbia, Yale, Tubingen, and Madras universities, Professor Insler has taught at the prestigious Yale University since 1963. He is currently its Salisbury Professor of Sanskrit and Comparative Philology as well as the chairman of its Iranian Language Studies Department, a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and American, French and German Oriental Societies, among many others. He has published, including in our Hamazo, and lectured widely on subjects dealing with ancient languages and texts of India and Iran, including Zarathustra's Gathas. He has devoted a better part of his life to the study of our Zoroastrian fate, its history, and its practices. But that is not why the World Zoroastrian Organization proposes to honor him so uniquely today. Like him, Many non-Zoroastrian scholars have similarly devoted their lives to the study of ours. What distinguishes Professor Insler from them is that his scholarship is not based on philology alone. His knowledge of all aspects of Zoroastrianism, its practices and history is so profound, his belief in them so deep, and his conviction in that truth so genuine that they premade his translation of Zarathustra's Gathas and seem to reveal the real meanings underlining our professors, prophets' teachings, and ethical philosophies. So much so that his translation is considered to be one of the most current and definitive works in that area. The same profoundness and understanding has also come true in his articles wherever published. So do they in his lectures on Zoroastrianism, whether at WZ forums or before lay Zoroastrian and non-Zoroastrian audiences around the world, or at several scholarship gatherings. Always using simple understandable English, like today. His writings and talks can be easily comprehended by all such audiences and forums alike. By doing so, Professor Insler has given a new dimension to Zarathustra's Gathas and brought its beauty and meanings within the grasp of all who choose to know them. His devotion to Zarathustra's message 
has been demonstrated by his willingness to travel tirelessly anywhere in the world to speak and explain those messages with simplicity and clarity to all such audiences. His service to WZO and the community in making our profit and his teachings known so far and wide is perhaps unmatched by any living Zoroastrian or non-Zoroastrian scholar. Professor Insler is, a devoted, is devoted to the Judaistic faith in which he was born. Yet, he has also chosen to live by the principles of Bohumenu and Asha, which constitutes the bedrock of our faith. He is thus a living example of a non-Zoroastrian who not only applies his scholarship of ancient languages to the basic scriptures of Zarathustra, but also chooses to put its principles into practice in all aspects of his daily living, like all Zoroastrians do. What Professor Insler has done for the cause of Zoroastrianism, both for and beyond WZO, stems from his deep respect for and conviction in the rationality of the truth of Zarathustra's teaching. No non-Zoroastrian therefore deserves to be recognized and honored by WZO and perhaps the community. On behalf of the WZO, and this has been passed unanimously by the International Board all over the world, Stanley, I'm privileged to bestow the honor never bestowed by it to a non-Zoroastrian of naming and co-opting him as the fellow of the World Zoroastrian Organization. Yeah, yeah. You better come here, they won't hear from you here. <laughs> On behalf of the World Zoroastrian Organization, I'd like to pre present Stanley with this scroll which obviously you can frame in your house. It's a film on. Yes. And I'll read this to you, and then you can come and view it afterwards. The International Board of the World Zoroastrian Organization is pleased to bestow on Professor Stanley Insler, Insler the singular honor of Fellow of the World Zoroastrian Organization. Professor Insler has devoted his life to the study of Zoroastrian religion. His knowledge of all aspects of our faith, its beliefs, practices, and history is so profound, profound and deep that his translations of Zarathustra's Grathas bring out the real meaning underlying our prophet's teachings and ethical philosophies. So do many of his teaching articles and lectures on Zoroastrian. As a result, his translation of the Gathas, written in simple and understandable English, can be easily comprehended by lay people rather than scholars alone. Professor Insler, whilst devoted to the fate into which he was born, has chosen to live by the principles of Vahu Menu and Asha, thereby showing his deep respect and conviction in the truth of Zarathustra's teaching. Professor Inlers, Inslers has willingly graced the numerous seminars held by WZO over 24 years. Thank you, sir. Oh, I'm speechless, which you know is an unnatural condition for me. But uh, I want to say I'm deeply honored and thrilled, Gerard, that uh, I have become a fellow of the World Zoroastrian Organization. It's always a pleasure to be here in London. I have so many friends among its membership, and I always find you as an audience the most receptive, right, engaged, and wonderful people. And for the board and everyone else, uh, let me just say, uh, I'm 
I'm so happy. Of yes, I'm working on a revised edition right not so philologically complex, but with more explanatory material and introduction. I hope to finish it, as I say every year at the end of the summer. But it will come, right? It will come. So I hope I hope by the end of this summer. Right? I have always put quality over quantity. 